Um, we're going to do an alternate reading. Uh, it's only three verses, so I'll read the first verse. Then we'll all respond with the second verse, and then I'll go ahead and read that third verse. So again, that's Luke 24, verses 15 through 17. May the Lord bless the reading of God's word. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Friends, we are uh, continuing this part two of our sermon series on life together, talking about life in a community of Christ. And um, last week, uh, we mentioned that uh, this sermon series is based on uh, two books, uh, Life Together by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and then kind of a book that uh, you can see was very much inspired because the title is very similar, called Life Together in Christ by Ruth Haley Barton. And just kind of for review, um, because I think this will be important, as we move forward um, in this series, that last week we were sort of kind of theoretically setting up what the community of Christ is about. And uh, so we were talking that uh, the, the only thing that really makes a community of Christ is that you're building it on Christ, right? And so we talked about this idea of Jesus being the cornerstone. The cornerstone is that um, in ancient building practices, it is the corner piece that you would place first. It would be the biggest, sturdiest uh, stone that you could find and that you would build two walls, and it would join those two walls together. And so that would mark out the rest of your building. In much the same way that we build our communities on Christ and nothing else, not on friendship, not on um, our shared interests, not on whether we like someone or not, but solely on Christ. And so um, that was sort of a little bit theoretical last week, um, but we are going to increasingly, starting today, be getting very practical. What does that mean? How can you live in a Christian community and live this out? Um, and so uh, today's message is called, People Are Strange. So that uh, particular phrase is uh, f- borrowed from a song uh, by The Doors that's, well, it's called People Are Strange. Um, and in, in that song, I, by the way, uh, I was telling some people that I was naming this sermon this and that it's based on a Doors song. So The Doors are, uh, they were a uh, a classic rock group uh, from the 60s. Does anyone know The Doors? So this is kind of a, this was sort of a little bit of a bet to see, like, like would anyone know who The Doors are? It, I saw a good solid three hands. <laughs> so I, I, it, I promise I'm not going to sing the song. I thought about it, but I was like, you know what? I'm going to spare people that. Um, but the, the, the prominent lyrics from the song, it says, people are strange when you're a stranger, right? And then the chorus is like, when you're strange, and It talks about all these things that happen when you're strange. But what I like about that song is they connect that idea of strangeness with being a stranger, right? You have that in the very uh, word, strange, stranger, right? So strangers are strange to us. They they can sometimes impose an element of of, uh, uncertainty, of danger even, right? Maybe you were told from the time you were a kid to stay away from strangers, don't talk to strangers, or simply just stranger danger, right? If you see a stranger and they offer you a lollipop, tell you to get in their white van, you're supposed to yell out, stranger danger, stranger danger, and go running down the street and go find like someone in a uniform or something. You know, <laughs> that's what we're taught from the time we're young. We're told to mistrust and not deal warmly with strangers because they can be dangerous, right? And so friends, um, you know, as, as we think about this, um, Because the scripture is going to have a lot to say about welcoming the stranger. I think it is important for us to think about how do we deal with strangers? I got to tell you, for for me, from the time I was young, maybe it was because of those messages that I heard, you know, don't talk to strangers and all that. I think some of it's also that I was very shy as a kid, that I never dealt well with strangers when I was younger. Um, So there's this one thing that I remember very um, prominently in my mind. I was probably you know, maybe, um, like, like maybe around like nine or 10 years old when this happened, a little bit older than my oldest daughter, Lise. Um, my, my brother used to go to this after school program where he get tutoring and I would just have to wait there while he was getting his tutoring. And so they had a waiting room. They had all these magazines there. And I decided that I was going to bring my own magazines because I just went to this book fair and I bought all of these, like, um, do you guys remember like highlights magazine? 
where, where, yeah, yeah, they were fun, right? Like, like you, it's like you had the two pictures, like, you know, what, what doesn't belong here? And, and you, you'd find, like, you know, I don't know, someone was trying to brush their teeth with a flower or something, and you're like, that doesn't belong, right? And you circle it. And um, I had a bunch of those magazines, and I was, like, reading them. You know, I was happy as a clam, you know, just reading my highlights magazines. And then we had to go, and we rushed in the car, and, um, like, like, we were about to leave the parking lot. I was like, Mom, I forgot my magazines. And so she's like, well, go get them, right? So I ran back inside. Remember, I'm like nine years old, nine, ten. And I go and I see the most horrifying thing. There's a strange girl reading my magazines, right? So then I go back to the car and I say, Mom, Dad, uh, you know, or, you know my, my mom's like, Where, where's the magazines? I'm like, they're gone. She's like, what do you mean they're gone? I'm like, I can't get them. She's like, what do you mean you can't get them? They're, they're missing? Like, no. She's like, so why can't you get them? I'm like, because a girl was reading them. <laughs> and so my mom was like, oh my gosh. And she takes me by the hand. It was one of the most embarrassing things. It's like, oh, I'm sorry. Those are my son's magazines. And I'm like this, right? I'm just like, like try, I'm like, I was like turning bright red. And so, yeah, I mean, it's one thing. They, they were strange, right? That person was strange, but it was also a girl. She had cooties. I didn't know what kind of disease it, uh, diseases I could get, right? So, um, yeah, you know, I'd like to say that I've gotten a little bit better since I was nine years old. Um, you know, <laughs> being a pastor helps is that, you know, you, you have to talk to people that you don't know. Uh, but maybe, you know, maybe there's some of us who it's not as extreme as nine-year-old Steve, but you may still struggle with talking to strangers. Now, how many of you, when you're like, you know, f- uh, flying, and you're not sitting next to someone you know, that you have a little bit of anxiety about sitting next to a stranger and that stranger trying to strike up a conversation with you. Any of you like try to pretend like you're sleeping, like you're just like, you know, it's like, and then you're flying to Korea, so it's gonna be like 16 hours, like, oh my gosh, you know, (laughs) like this is gonna be really bad. But it's like, it makes you nervous. You know, you don't know what that strange person is gonna talk to you about or what kind of probing questions they're gonna ask, or maybe they have bad breath, or maybe they're gonna get up all in your personal space, or you know, you never know. And so that can be very uh, intimidating for a lot of us. You know, strangers, they can be strange. And yet, what scripture tells us is that it is important for us to learn to deal with strangers. There's something very uh, spiritual about that. And so we're gonna get more into that, but I just wanna acknowledge, friends, that some of the things that we're going to be talking about this sermon series are very challenging. If you didn't hear our sermon uh, from last week, I, I encourage you to go onto our website, uh, livinggraceministry.org, and James Coe very faithfully uploads the videos every week. There's also podcasts that Mike White puts up every week. So that's my little commercial. <laughs> but I, I want to encourage you to listen to it because it was very challenging in a lot of things that um, we were talking about some of these ideas of what we think Christian community should be like and and how it it really is. And a lot of those things shatter the image of what we think Christian community should be. And friends, I just want to acknowledge that this isn't easy. And when we talk about welcoming the stranger as Jesus would want us to do, um, I don't want to gloss over the fact that it's going to make you uncomfortable for a lot of us especially if you already don't like talking and meeting with strangers. You know, there's a lot in our society that that tells you not to do it, right? That it's it's unwise, you know? And so we're going to battle against some of the messages that we've always heard from the time you were very young, you know? And so I'm not great at this, friends. And I'm not the only one, I'm sure, who feels uncomfortable sometimes with strangers, with people who are different than the other in our midst. Right? And so I just want to acknowledge that, that if, if it's going to make you a little uncomfortable, I just want you to acknowledge that and to push through a little bit, at least just as you hear this sermon. Don't let your mind, because our minds like to do this, don't let your mind let you check out. Sometimes when we hear uncomfortable things, we just start to check out. Right? Like, oh, let's check Facebook or you know, let's daydream about you know, what we're going to do later today. Don't do that, friends. I, I encourage you. Let's stay with that tension that comes when it comes to really being the community God wants us to be, especially when it comes to strangers. 
So in the story that we started last week, and this is going to be the ongoing story throughout the sermon series about uh, two people, two disciples who are walking to Emmaus from Jerusalem after the events of Jesus' death and resurrection. And they're trying to make sense of the resurrection because they don't really know um, fully that Jesus is resurrected. All they know is that Jesus' body is missing, that some people went to see him, and some people claim that they saw Jesus, but they're not quite convinced. So they're trying to make sense of this, and they're talking along the road, and while they're talking, a really weird thing happens, is a stranger just starts walking with them, right? And even more than that, which is really rude, but the stranger just butts in their conversation, right? And so I, I put up this picture, this painting of uh, the road to Emmaus, and I just thought this was kind of funny, because it's like, they didn't know that that was Jesus. But when you look at this painting, you're like, well, that's obviously Jesus. He's wearing all whites, right? He's got the Jesus beard, right? <laughs> so I don't know if it would have been this, this obvious if he would have been wearing all whites. And, you know, there's other pictures, that, not in this one, but like Jesus is glowing. In some other paintings, like, like from like the uh, Middle Ages and Renaissance, Jesus is floating off the ground. I'm like, come on, <laughs> right? Like he wouldn't be floating off the ground because they, they didn't know it was him. Right? They just thought he was a fellow traveler. You know, this was an oft-traveled road. And so, you know, the traveler is just, you know, he's just walking up alongside them. And as they're talking, he actually enters into their conversation. Right? So um, this is what it says in verse 15. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood still, their faces downcast. So friends, you know, I, I, I don't know back in biblical times um, if that was an okay thing to do. But we know by today's standards, that would be considered very rude. You know, like, can you imagine that you're like at a restaurant and you're talking with your friend and, and you, you're like getting really into it. And some person from another table just sits down next to you guys like, what are you guys talking about? It sounds really interesting, right? <laughs> like, that would not be okay. You'd be like, dude, mind your own business. Like, get out of here, stranger. Maybe you'll just yell, stranger danger, stranger danger. Why are you talking to us? Why are you bothering us? Butt out. But the disciples don't do that. And they, you know, well, they, they sort of entertain him and they, they try to explain to him what's going on. And Jesus kind of plays dumb. He acts like he doesn't know what's going on, right? And it's very interesting because, um, you know, they're like, are you the only person who hasn't heard about all the events in Jerusalem? Like, come on, man. Can you imagine like talking to someone about like 9-11, someone in America, like, are you the only one who didn't know what happened on September 11th? Like, seriously, how could you not know? Were you living under a rock? And that's what they kind of feel like. But in, through the course of this, they continue to walk with Jesus. And the story culminates, actually, with not only them talking to Jesus, but they invite Jesus into their home, right? Which is kind of going the extra mile. They're like, hey, it's getting late. They're not like, oh, hey, that was a good conversation, stranger who butt into our conversation. They're like, hey, why don't you stay with us? Right, which even for that time would have been very um, radical, you know? They go that extra mile. It's very intimate. They don't know who this guy is yet. They don't know that he's Jesus yet, right? And yet they make themselves very exposed. It's very vulnerable to have someone enter your home. You know, they're going to see all your personal stuff. You know, they, they didn't know they were having guests over. Whenever we have guests over, you know, like, like we got to prepare, right? We, we got to make sure that we get all the dirty laundry, all the kids' socks that are strewn across the, what are the kids' home? They just throw their socks everywhere. We just find like little socks, you know, <laughs> cute little dirty socks everywhere. You know, we, we want to just make sure we, we just get all that stuff out. Right? We, want, we don't want people to see those kinds of things. But here, they let this stranger in, and he just gets to see their lives as it is, right? Very intimate, very interesting. You know, and friends, what we see in this is something that may be very radical to welcome a stranger in this way. But there's a great biblical precedent for this in terms of welcoming strangers. And so um, 
I, I want to take a look at some of these passages that talk about um, welcoming strangers. And some of them are kind of weird, to be honest. Like, yeah, it's kind of strange when they talk about welcoming strangers. Let's take a look at Hebrews 13, 1 through 2. This is a really interesting passage. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. The the old phrase for this uh, in different translations, they say some have entertained angels and not even known it. You know, that, it's such a weird idea. Like, like, yeah, you know, there's a weird person that you just met. You didn't know who they were. And it turns out it was an angel in disguise. There's stories about this in the Old Testament. There's a story where Abraham and Sarah, who were, you know, they lived a semi-nomadic life. They, they had a big caravan and they'd travel around. And uh, they would kind of set up camp for just for, you know, a few days at a time, maybe at the most couple weeks. And while they were there, other people who were traveling through, they would come by. And there's one story where three strangers came and they welcomed them in and they they said, hey, come and rest and we'll get you some water. And then they baked them some cakes from flour and they got them um, some meats with some cheese curds and got them this nice meal. And then they found out later that these people were actually angels. They were messengers of God. And they were the ones who assured Abraham and Sarah that Sarah would have a child that they would have that promise fulfilled that, that God would be faithful to them, that they would have many descendants, right? And so, you know, these stories, I got to tell you, they're a little weird, right? Um, but it goes even further in terms of the way that um, Scripture talks about entertaining strangers. Um, so this is from Jesus' own words, Matthew 25, 37 to 40. He says, the righteous will answer him. And this is talking about like sort of at the last days, there'll be a judgment um, that these two groups of people would be separated. And the righteous would be separated from the unrighteous. And so um, that this is what uh, they say to the Lord. Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And so here we see Jesus very explicitly saying, it's not only that in some mystical way that we don't understand, when you welcome a stranger, you could be welcoming an angel. But in a way, when you welcome a stranger, you're welcoming me. You're welcoming Jesus. Right? It, it's, it's a very different way of thinking about strangers. Right? Um, there were these Benedictine monks, and we talked last week about um, the order of St. Benedict just a little bit. Um, but they took this verse literally. They thought to themselves, when anyone comes to our doorstep, we are going to welcome them as if it is Jesus. So I want to read from you a portion of the rule of St. Benedict. It's very interesting what they would do. And just think about, as, as you read this, or as we talk about this, think about how we welcome people at LGM or how you would welcome a stranger at your door, right? And friends, um, as I'm thinking about this, I think about how I welcome strangers, um, how I welcome like Jehovah's Witnesses or people who are trying to sell me on a window replacement, right? Um, My family, we're looking at getting a new dog and our old dog used to like just bark at, at people when they would come. Just, it was a tiny little dog, like a poodle terrier mix. He's a cute guy, so friendly. He wouldn't hurt a fly, but he had a big bark, right? And there are a couple of times Jehovah's Witnesses will come and like, hey, can we talk to you? And our dog would be, rawr, 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 rawr. and they would like, oh, okay, well, we're just going to leave. And I'm like, good dog, good dog. <laughs> <laughs> so friends, I, I have to admit that this is very challenging when you look at the way these monks would welcome strangers, and the way I welcome strangers. He said, uh, so this is what Benedict said, all guests who present themselves are to be welcomed as Christ, for he himself will say, I was a stranger and you welcomed me, right? That's from the verse we just read. Once a guest has been announced, the superior and the brothers are to meet him with all the courtesy of love. All humility should be shown in addressing a guest on arrival or departure. By a bow of the head, 
or by a complete prostration of the body, Christ is to be adored because he is indeed welcomed in them. Friends, you know what it means to prostrate yourself? I'm not going to do it because I'm, I'm getting old and it might be hard to get up. But when you prostrate yourself, you lie down on the ground flat with your head, with your face to the floor, and you just spread your arms out. It is a completely uh, vulnerable position, right? And this is what they would do to dignitaries. This is what you would do to a king, right, back in the day. If a king came, you might prostrate yourself. Oh, king, you are so awesome and honorable, and we are not worthy. So you would just lay on the ground and be completely vulnerable in front of them. And it was a way of honoring somebody. And so, you know, they would bow, they would get on the floor, just in this completely submissive and just very honoring position. Now, friends, you know, we try to welcome newcomers to LGM. I've never done that, right? <laughs> but why? Why would they do that? Because they believed that when you welcomed the stranger, you were welcoming Jesus. You bow, you prostrate yourself, not because this person is so great, but because there is Christ in your midst when you do that, right? And then it goes on to say, um, after the guests have been received, they should be invited to pray. The abbot shall pour water on the hands of the guests, and the abbot with the entire community shall wash their feet. Now, you may know that that's, uh, there's a great tradition of that for Christianity, that Jesus washed the feet of his disciples um, in the moment when they were bickering about who would be the greatest, in this great servile act, Jesus watched the feet of his disciples. And if you go to one of these monasteries and you were a, uh, just a stranger, you could be a robber, you could just be a delivery person, you could be someone just, you know, I don't know, someone who's lost. You go to that abbey, they would treat you like an honored guest and you'd get a foot washing, right? Um, it's very interesting, too, that um, uh, I didn't include this part of it, but uh, if you were fasting, because monks would often fast, um, the abbot, the, the head of the monastery, could break their fast so that the, the, the person who was coming would feel welcome, so they wouldn't eat alone, right? That's how highly they thought of it. I mean, you think about, like, all these monks' disciplines, right, and how seriously they took them. They said, but because the stranger is there with you, the abbot can break their fast. But not the rest of the monks. You guys have to keep your fast. It, that's actually in there too. <laughs> but um, friends, that's how honored strangers were. It's challenging, isn't it? It's so humbling to see how honored um, strangers are supposed to be when it talks about it in Scripture. And for many of us, friends, I think we have to take seriously the fact that you know, there are people who've lived this out. There are ways that scripture talks about this, and it's not meant to be just a nice idea. We are actually supposed to do it. And then we have to ask ourselves the question, are we doing it or not? And if we're not, why not? Friends, um, I, I think the truth of the matter is, is that we don't always treat strangers in such a way. And even more than that, I mean, Scripture goes farther than just a stranger who you don't know. I mean, a stranger could be a friend you haven't met yet, right? You know, a stranger could become your best friend. You know, all of our friends were strangers at some time, weren't they? Unless you grew up from them in their time, you, you know, you were babies together or something like that. But most of our friends were strangers at one time, right? So a stranger could be good, a stranger could be bad. But what about the ones who are just bad? This is what Bonhoeffer says about um, life together. This is actually at the very beginning of his book. He says, Jesus Christ lived in the midst of his enemies. At the end, all his disciples deserted him. On the cross, he was utterly alone, surrounded by evildoers and mockers. For this cause, he had come to bring peace to the enemies of God. So the Christian, too, belongs not in the seclusion of a cloistered life, but in the thick of thorns. There is in his This is how uh, Bonhoeffer Everyone just get along and love and gentleness and, you know, lots of hugs and it's going to feel good and, warms and warm and fuzzies and all this stuff. But he begins his book about saying the life together 
if nothing else, if you look at the life of Jesus, it's a life with enemies. It's a life with people you don't like. That should be life together. And then he goes on to quote Martin Luther, and this is, <laughs> gets a, li- a little even more challenging. So Martin Luther said, the kingdom is to be in the midst of your enemies. And he who will not suffer this does not want to be of the kingdom of Christ. He wants to be among friends, to sit among roses and lilies, not with the bad people, but the devout people. Oh, you blasphemers and betrayers of Christ. If Christ had done what you are doing, who would ever have been spared? I mean, Martin Luther doesn't mince, with mince words. He says, you are betraying Christ if you are not willing to sit, to fellowship, to be amongst the people that you don't naturally like. Whew, challenging stuff, right? So friends, why is this so important? Why is this such a big deal? So um, this is a picture that I saw, and I don't think they were using this in the context that I'm going to use it here. Um, this is like one of those motivational like posters, right? Your comfort zone and where the magic happens, right? Where the magic happens is outside of your comfort zone, not subtle, right? We all understand what that means. If you just stay in your comfort zone, nothing magical will happen. You're not going to be able to break through into success. You're going to stay in things that you've always done, stay in routines and stay in habits. And as a motivational pastor, uh, as a uh, motivational poster, excuse me, a little slip there, (laughs) um, that makes sense, right? We understand what that means. You can't just stay comfortable. But friends, what about when it comes to community? What about when it comes to the Christian life? What would that little circle there be the comfort zone. What would that look like in our church? Friends, let me tell you what that looks like for me. And and, and I am speaking for myself. That comfort zone for me looks like a place where I'm surrounded by other Christians. And all those Christians are Asian, probably Korean, because I'm Korean. Preferably speaking English, because I speak English. Right? Preferably have some of the same life experiences that I've had, have the same kind of temperament that I have, all agreeable, all these people I just get along with, you know, just no troublemakers, no strangers, right? That's what my comfort zone looks like. Did I describe LGM? Did I describe our church? Is that a comfort zone, friends? You know, so this is challenging for me, friends. Being a pastor and reading these passages that talk about welcoming strangers, that talk about welcoming Christ in our midst, when you welcome the least of these, well, who are the least of these? The ones that you esteem the least, the ones that you value the least, that's who Jesus is talking about, not the ones you value the most. That's human community. Any of us can find that. You can go out and look at every community in the entire world and you're going to see people surrounding themselves with people that they like, with people that they feel the most comfortable with, not the least. But Jesus says, I will not be found amongst the most. I will be found amongst the least. Right? And friends, this is a challenging thing. Right? And so please understand my heart as a pastor. I love you guys. I don't mean any, well, okay, maybe I mean some offense. <laughs> But I will say this, friends. I I don't stand in judgment of you, but I I want you to hear this because I think it's important. I think oftentimes we seek churches like this because we want to be comfortable, right? Because we want to be surrounded by people who are like us. And and I'm not saying that's entirely a bad thing. Um, When I was younger, um, I grew up in Cincinnati where there weren't a lot of Asians. And I felt like an outsider. I always felt like there was something like, you know, different about me. Obviously, I looked different than other people. But I felt that because I was treated like that. The way people look at me. You know, in Cincinnati, there weren't a lot of Asians. So anytime I'd walk into a room, everyone would turn and look. Oh, hey, that guy's different, right? They may not say anything, right? They may not tease me. Sometimes they would. They, they may not make a big fuss, but everyone would notice. I remember the first time I went to a big Christian camp. To me, it was a big Christian camp. It was probably about 80 kids, 80 youth, 
who were all around my age, all were, were Korean Americans who spoke English, and I've never felt so comfortable in my life. It was a breath of fresh air. And it, like this great idea that, man, I might even find a girlfriend here, right? It was like the greatest thing. I wanted to go every year. I always wanted to be in those circles, Korean American Christians, where I would feel accepted, right? And I sought that out. Every time I go to find a church, I try to find a church like this, if I had a choice. And so, friends, you know, it, it's challenging because, you know, you're like, Pastor Steve, I'm so confused. Are you telling us to leave? <laughs> you know? Um, friends, what I've been learning is that there's a reason why the magic happens outside of your comfort zone. There's a reason why you meet Jesus when you meet the stranger. And I think the reason is this. Because you can love the people that you like without Jesus. Do you hear that, friends? You can love the people that you already get along with. You can love the people who are like you without Jesus. You don't need Jesus. They're just called friends, right? Or just your natural community that you're gonna be you're gonna gravitate towards anyways. Right? For to love a stranger, someone who is genuinely strange, someone who is genuinely not like you, you are going to need Jesus' help. You're gonna need the power of the Holy Spirit. There's this one time where I thought that God would be calling me away from LGM a couple of years ago. And I went to interview at a church in Seattle where it was very, very diverse. And um, when I say diverse, I don't mean that it was like, you know, 10% black people or, you know, 5% Latino. It was like seriously like M&Ms. I mean, they were just all mixed up. They spoke 70 different languages at that, that church. I mean, it like seriously, like, like it, it just every, you know, race, every nationality you could imagine was at this church, Right? And I didn't end up, you know, getting that job. Um, and for some reason, you know, God put me back at LGM, and I came back. But when I was asked to come back to LGM, um, I had uh, one request. And my one request was this. So this was two years ago, I made this request. I said, I have gotten this bug. I have seen what a multicultural church looks like. Would we be willing to move towards that? If you are, then I will come back. If not, I think maybe, you know, we might just need to move on. If we are committed to that, I will come back. And so the leadership of this church said yes. So that's why I came back. So it's been two years, right? And we do have some diversity. Maybe not exactly right at this moment, but there are times where we have people who aren't exactly like us. And friends, what I mean to say by this is not that, you know, it's not to say that this is going to happen overnight, but in our hearts, in our minds, how committed are we to actually loving people who are not like us, to actually welcoming the stranger into our midst? I realize this is going to be a process, right? And that's what I committed to when I came back. I know this is going to take time, right? I know that it's going to stretch us. You're going to be leaving your comfort zone when you commit to love the stranger. But let me say this, that that's kind of a bold vision. Like, can we be like M&Ms here at this church? Just all different colors and all different, you know, nations and all different languages. That would be awesome. That would be a little glimpse of heaven. And I think that when the world sees that, when a world sees communities like that, they say, that is amazing. Because you don't normally see that. You normally see people gravitate towards people they're like. So when you see people who don't naturally get along, and they're worshiping side by side, and they're singing about the greatness of God, then people can see Jesus in their midst. They see that and they say, that is supernatural. There's no way people did that by their own ability. Because those people have been fighting for, you know, thousands of years, for millennia. They haven't been getting along, and yet here they are, and they're singing about Jesus, arm in arm, hand in hand, and they're doing it together in love. It's amazing. That can only be a work of God. And I think that's why it's so compelling for me. Because 
that is what the Bible says heaven is going to be like. There's going to be no separation of, uh, of, of nations. There's not going to be people who are like, oh, you know, this is the Korean section of heaven, all right? All the Koreans hang out here, then all the black people hang out here, all the white people. There's going to be none of that. Friends, if that's what heaven's going to be like, right? God keeps saying the kingdom of God is near. It is at hand. We've got to start living into that now. We've got to start getting used to that idea. So friends, I know that seems like a lofty dream, and it is. That may not be in our distant uh, uh, future, or, or in, the real, real, in the very close future, right? It might be uh, a little bit distant for us. But I will say this. Can we, in the meantime, learn how to love the people you're with now? Because even the people we're with, we're not all that great at welcoming the stranger who's just strange in the sense that you just don't know them yet. Maybe some of us, this is very challenging. This is something that we've tried at our church at different times. And this, this isn't a law. I'm, I'm not going to ask you to do this in terms of, you know, like, like some legalistic way. But from time to time, we've challenged people at this church. Can you, in the first five minutes of fellowship time, first five minutes you come to church, first five minutes uh, during lunchtime, can you go and talk to somebody that you don't know as well for the first five minutes? The truth of the matter is, is we all have people that you naturally gravitate towards. You don't need to make a decision. You're going to find your friends. You're going to find the people you like. You're going to find the people you have interests that are aligned. It just naturally happens. No one needs to command you to do that. No one needs to set aside time for your friends. You're going to find time for your friends. And if you don't find time for them here, you're going to find time for them outside of church. It will happen. So what we need to be intentional about is not finding your friends. You need to be intentional about finding the other, about finding the stranger, whoever that may be, and intentional about learning to love them. Is it going to be awkward? You betcha. Are you going to be outside of your comfort zone? I hope so. That's the point. And to learn to love that person and to see them as a brother or sister, potentially, in Christ. To really feel like when you are talking to that person, you are welcoming Christ into your midst, right? And friends, this is something that I want us to learn to practice. We were talking uh, last week about, well, well in our um, family uh, small group last week, we were talking about the story with the, the Good Samaritan, right? And um, that... You know, we're talking about this idea of welcoming people that are different than us. And, you know, how well do we even do that at church? And so uh, someone in our small group was like, hey, I think we, we, we got to practice, right? We got to practice. And so, you know, we were trying to, like, come up with questions. What are questions you can ask each other and things like that? Like, you know, someone suggested that we come up with three questions and ask that to people. Um, but friends, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be that, that forced or mechanical you know, but maybe that's something that we can do even now. So we are in a sermon, and I know we all understand sermons are a time where a pastor comes up and talks, and we all listen, right? But to me, that's not really church. Church is when we get up and we actually start being the body of Christ. So I want to give you some time right now, before we close, to actually go and talk to people that you don't normally talk to. Right? And you don't even need to say, ask like all these probing questions like, so what was the name of your street when, where you grew up? What was the name of your first pet? You know, um, somebody very jokingly said that when we were coming up with these questions, what are the three questions that they're like, these sound like the security questions they ask when, when you lost your pin, right? <laughs> you don't need to ask your security questions. You know, but maybe you can just go up to someone and say, hey, you know what, I'm glad you're here. Um, you know, I, I, maybe you can introduce yourself. Maybe you don't know that person's name. Um, and, and maybe that's all it is, is you say, I'm glad you're here. My name is so-and-so, and just, it, it's just really nice to meet you. Say it and mean it. Look them in the eye and receive that when they say that to you. You know, you don't need to ask questions like an interview for a, country club, like, hey, where are you from, and what, 
How much money do you make? What is your job? You don't need to ask those kinds of questions, right? I know sometimes um, I, I feel all this pressure when I meet people like, oh, so where are you from? And oh, you know, what do you do? And all this stuff. And those are the normal questions we ask. And we ask those questions sometimes because we're nervous, right? But can we just in this time actually do this? Actually get up. So I want everyone to get up and talk to somebody that you don't know very well. Just ask them your name if you don't know it. Hey, friends, can I, can, can I say this? Some of you, guys, guys, real quick, some of you have been going to the same church with people and you don't know their name. That's okay. Can we just say, no shame? Can everyone say, no shame? No shame. If you don't know someone's name, that's okay. Just reintroduce yourself. In fact, let's do it this way. You meet someone, just say your name, okay? <laughs> like, like, they don't even need to ask you. Like, like, even if you're like, you should know my name. That's okay, right? No shame, right? Just introduce yourself, right? And just say, I'm glad you're here. I'm really glad you're here. So guys, go up and, and if we can just greet a few people that we don't know. Yeah, it's awkward. That's okay. We're learning. We're getting over it. Friends, um, did, did anyone die? Did anyone collapse when we did that? No, you, you're all okay? Was that awkward a little bit? Friends, whenever you feel awkward again in those situations, especially when you are doing it in the name of Jesus, I want you to think, you know, replace those words. Awkward. I want you to hear Jesus. <laughs> it's a Jesus moment. I'm being serious, friends, Right? I, I hate that word awkward. I hate how we use that in our society. I hate how we use it anytime there's something that could stretch you to where the magic happens. And it snaps you back like a rubber band. It keeps you from, from the precipice of really entering into a community of Christ. And we say, awkward! And then we just totally just snap ourselves back from that. Friends, um, you know, we, we were talking about this too at our, our family Bible study. We used to have a longer greeting time when we would pass the peace. And um, it used to be everyone would just get up and it was just like, just people just walking around and, you know. Um, and increasingly, as we've gotten a little bit bigger and just maybe over time, um, it's like people have not strayed as far from their pew. It used to be everyone would get up and they would like, just everyone would just like go around the entire church and it would take a while. Right? And just, I've noticed that just our, our, our sort of track or our roots that we take during greeting time has gotten shorter, you know, and it's become like, you know, for some people, it's just, you spin around, hey, <laughs> welcome, right? Then you sit down, right? And you're done, right? And I know this because you may know that I use my iPad, right, to uh, get my notes, right? And so I get up here and I used to be able to have plenty of time to get my notes, because everyone's greeting each other. Nowadays, I get up here and everyone's quiet and they're looking at me and I'm still looking at my notes because the time has gotten so short, right? Friends, I just say this, that this is practice. You know, maybe we're not great at it. Maybe you do feel awkward. But friends, I think that this is where the magic happens. I think this is where we learn to let Christ into our midst. That even as you meet someone, maybe you're saying a prayer, Jesus, be here, because I don't know what to say. That's okay. That's okay. Jesus is there with you. This is how we learn to love the other. And I got to say, when I see you guys greeting each other, I mean, just, you know, from a personal standpoint, man, it makes my heart smile. It's so awesome to see you all just getting up and loving on each other, even though you don't know each other super well. Maybe some of you are meeting each other for the first time, really meeting each other. But friends, God is pleased with that. Let's keep going, friends. Let's build the foundation of this community on Christ, not on what makes you comfortable, but on what Christ commands us to do and what he promises will happen when you do that. I will be there. I will be there. I will be honored. 
I will be glorified. And I am so pleased with you when you do that, when you welcome the stranger, when you welcome the one who is different than you. So praise team, can we come up? Maybe let's just uh, say a short prayer. Friends, we, we uh, talked last week about not trying to insert our own wish dream into the community of Christ. But maybe instead of trying to insert our own wish dream, we can just ask, God, what do you want from us? What do you want for this ministry? And maybe we can just listen. So let's just take a moment to do that. God, what do you want from us? What do you want to see emerge in LGM, in our midst? Maybe some of us, this isn't your regular place of worship for some of our friends who are visiting. But maybe wherever you go back to, whatever community you're a part of, what is it that God would want to see come to fruition in the short term at least? How can we love the other, the stranger in our midst? And what would our communities look like if we did that? So let's go before God with that question. God, what is it that you want from us? Jesus, how do you want to be made manifest in our midst? Let's just stay with that. Let's just pray that for a moment. Let's just be still and receive that from God right now. Lord, how awesome is it when your people come together and they learn to love each other as Christ loves us. And we learn to love the other. We learn to love the stranger. We learn to love the one who is not like us. God, you are so pleased with that. You are so honored by that. And Lord, even though we're learning how to do this, it is awkward. It is uncomfortable. It will stretch us, Lord. But it will stretch us in the direction of your Son, Jesus Christ. So we, we, we want to go there with you, God. We want to be stretched and challenged in that way so that you can be honored in our midst and we can be the community that builds on you, God, that builds on your son, Jesus Christ, who is welcomed in this place, in our love, in our communities. In Jesus' name we pray.